have um, a delegation here from the Indonesian Embassy and from the Chicago Consulate, um, Dr. Dino Padi Jafal, the ambassador, um, Dr. Um, Hario Winarso, the educational attaché, Mandala from the Chicago Consulate. I'd like to introduce the ambassador, uh, drawing from his biography, um, biographical sketch. Ambassador Jalal is the Indonesian ambassador to the United States. He's a speech writer, youth activist, academic, and author of a national bestseller. He was previously special staff for international affairs and presidential spokesperson for President Cecilio Bambang Yudhoyono a position that he held since October of 2004 and extended into the second term of um, the president's, um, when the president was re-elected. This makes him the longest serving presidential spokesperson in Indonesia's modern history. He completed his master's degree in political science at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia and received his doctorate from the London School of Economics and Political Science. He was instrumental in the development of several major um, initiatives. First, the U.S.-Indonesia Security Dialogue, an annual bilateral consultation on security and defense matters, which began in 2001 and continues to this day. The Forest 11 process, a dialogue process involving tropical rainforest nations in Asia, Africa, and Latin America to enhance their critical role as part of the global carbon sinks to climate change. The third, the Global Intermedia Dialogue, a process co-sponsored between Indonesia and Norway to promote press freedom as well as religious and cultural tolerance. Generation 21, a program which aims to awaken and develop a sense of identity among youth as the first generation of the 21st century. Dr. Jalal's greatest passion is youth affairs. In 2008, he established the Innovative Leaders Forum to promote innovative leadership from all sectors of Indonesian society. The forum has held a series of public seminars presenting emerging leaders in the fields of local governments, education, peace, health, bureaucratic reform, entrepreneurship, moderate Islam, and climate change. A recurring theme in his speeches is the imperative for the youth to think of themselves and avoid the rigid dogmatism that was characteristic of the intellectual upbringing of the past. He argues that the key to Indonesia's success is to develop a mindset driven by opportunity, not fear, and that xenophobia, ultranationalism, and radicalism are as destructive and distractive to Indonesia's present generation as corruption, collusion, and nepotism was to the generation of the 1980s. He's a member of the governing board of the Institute for Peace and Democracy, and a member of the executive board of the Indonesian Council on World Affairs. His fourth book, Harus Bisa, has become a national bestseller in Indonesia. Some 1.7 million copies have been printed. It contains political stories, anecdotes, and leadership lessons from the SBY presidency, taken from his personal diary as presidential spokesperson. The Jakarta Globe calls it the best book on leadership in Indonesia, and thousands of comments posted on Facebook have called it inspirational. It's my great pleasure to introduce Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction, which is probably better than what I have to say. <laughs> Good. Look, um, I want to talk about uh, Indonesia and I want to talk about uh, where we are and why uh, we should not take for granted about being where we are and how we should think about the future and I want to put it also in the context of the larger picture of uh, a new trend in the international relations which is the rise of uh, emerging powers. But let me talk first about 
the interesting phenomenon, which is uh, the rise of uh, emerging uh, powers. Uh, I remember a few years ago, I went to my uncle's home, and uh, he had a photo on his wall. And on that photo, it was a photo of him uh, having his shoe shined by some British man with a long hat. And you know he was very proud. He was around like this, and he was shining his shoes. And I'm like, you know, why are you hanging that? Do you know, do you know the man? He said, no. Why do you hang that? Well, you know, it makes me feel good uh, uh, having a British man shine shine my shoes. You know. And then I realized that my uncle had a a complex. You know, because his generation uh, lived under colonial uh, times, right? There was some kind of an inferiority complex that he needed that picture on the wall to make up for that, to make him feel confident. Right? It's, it's, for him, it's an artificial payback time, you know, uh, to have a, a European shiny shoes, right? And then fast forward, just a few years ago, I sat next to uh, a man, an Indonesian tycoon, I don't say the name, I'm not supposed to say his name, but I sat next to him on one of the presidential trips, and I said, hey, what's your plan? And he says, uh, well, I'm building this city, I'm building that media empire, and my plan is to buy Universal and Disney. Right? Again, I don't know if he's actually gonna buy that, but you know, he says, uh, oh, only takes 15 billion. I got that much, he says, something like that. You know? But the question was what happened between my uncle and this guy who sat next to me, this Indonesian guy who sat next to me on the plane. You know, there was a huge leap of confidence uh, of, of uh, mental transformation uh, that, that happened. Uh, this man was not just nationalistic, he had a global viewpoint. You know, he, had, he saw the world as not a threat, but as an opportunity. And he didn't have any baggages. He didn't have any historical baggage, he didn't have any cultural baggage, and he didn't have a sense of inferiority complex that some in my father's and my grandfather's generations uh, had. So, and this is a new trend that I see in our society, right? This trend that confidence, uh, self-esteem is very high, right? And this is something that I notice is happening across what is known as the emerging powers. You know, Brazil, China, India, uh, Turkey, South Africa, you know, uh, Colombia, uh, Chile, you know, they all have this. You know, this strange phenomenon that never had before, the feeling that they can uh, not just catch up, but sometimes leapfrog uh, you know, uh, areas previously dominated by developed countries. You know, feeling that uh, they can be as good, uh, that they can compete globally, right? and the feeling that they also have the answers to global issues. Right? Uh, and again, for us, for me in Indonesia, you know, I'm 47, uh, in my university years, in my government years, I've never seen this in Indonesia, and I've never seen this so strongly uh, in the uh, uh, emerging powers. Um, and I think this is uh, something very new to us, uh, and I think this is something that is going to shape the international system uh, in the in the years to come. Uh, and one of the reasons. Uh, which stimulate this rise of confidence in emerging powers uh, is the fact that for some countries uh, they see more success as being local grown, you know, homegrown. You know, in the past, uh, when people in Indonesia think of global success, you know, the names that come are quite typical. You know, um, Henry Ford, uh, who's the guy who found Kentucky Fried Chicken, Colonel. Sanders, you know, uh, Bill Gates, right? Yeah, all uh, similar sounding names, you know. But now success has uh, exotic faces and has uh, odd names, you know. Uh, Jack Ma, uh, what is it, Lee Ka Shin, uh, Karol Tanjung, uh, whatever. Uh, the Tata guy, I forget his name, you know. But uh, people in the developing countries, they see that, hey, you know, uh, icons of success can have our faces and our names as well. 
and this has a huge leap, uh, a huge impact on their level of confidence. Right? Uh, remember, you, you know what made the Asian countries uh, rise up in terms of their fight against colonialism? It was when the Japanese beat the Russians. Right? I don't know if you noticed, but to Indonesians, this is what sparked their nationalism. Why? Because it proved to Indonesians that, hey, the Orientals, uh, the yellow skin, can beat the white skin. Yeah? Because and, and they used to think that our grandfathers, grandfathers, that we would never be able to beat European powers. Right? Never. It's not in our destiny. Right? But the Japanese victory over Russians in the 1914 war uh, really awakened something in the Asian mindset that they could actually uh, uh, beat in militarily uh, European powers. And that's part of Indonesian nationalism and nationalism in other parts of Asia. Now, what happens now is something slightly different, or maybe even fundamentally different. It's not military uh, victory, you know. It's uh, uh, corporate success, you know. Uh, that is a new thing, you know, the new, what do you call it, the new stimulant to success among many uh, Asians. Uh, and in fact, a lot of this confidence in the emerging world that I'm talking about, a lot of it is corporate driven, you know, um, uh, has something to do with the growth of entrepreneurialism in Indonesia and in many emerging countries. And entrepreneurialism is a magical thing, you know, uh, why, what I say this is because in Indonesia, for some reason, we've been against or allergic to the concept of capitalism. Yeah. Uh, you go to campus, uh, students will say, we're anti-capitalistic. You know, uh, in the streets, uh, politicians, they, they don't like to use the word capitalism. In India, too. You know? uh, it's just such a dirty word somehow. Right? And for some reason, uh, you know, uh, that has proved to be uh, some kind of a hindrance. Right? Because, uh, look, in these days to survive, you've got to believe in markets and capital, right? This is 21st century. We live in the real world, right? And this is what's happening in Indonesia anyways, right? But when you replace capitalism with entrepreneurship, right, people become so accepting, right? Uh, so uh, what has happened in Indonesia in recent years, and also in China, in India, and many emerging countries, uh, people are gaining, they say entrepreneurship is uh, becoming uh, religion, is that how you say it? You know, people are already passionate about uh, embracing entrepreneurship. Uh, and uh, in a way, it's, it's, uh, it's something that changes the profile of our uh, economic actors and something that is uh, changing the economic energy of our society. Because you know, when you have a strong entrepreneurial drive, that becomes your uh, you know, oxygen uh, that accelerates uh, economic uh, growth. Uh, so, uh, the rise of entrepreneurship and the fact that you know, entrepreneurship is acceptable to countries that are dogmatically against the notion of capitalism, you know, uh, is a, a trend that, that matters in, in accelerating this trend of confidence uh, in, in, in these uh, emerging uh, economies. So uh, Indonesia is in a good place now. Uh, if you look at all the projections, to be honest, uh, it surprised me. I was in Indonesia 12, in the U.S. 12 years ago at the same embassy, and uh, I was a bit pessimistic back then because uh, our democracy was not working. Uh, we had separatist conflicts. We had uh, political crisis, constitutional crisis, instability, mass riots. Our economy contracted by 13 percent. Uh, nothing was working <laughs> in, in Indonesia in the year 1999 to 2000, right, until a uh, uh, little bit of 2001. Uh, and to be where we are today, I think we are blessed. You know, back then, many people believed Indonesia would turn up like Soviet Union and Yugoslavia, broken into pieces, crumbling, and bankrupt. You know. uh, but what happens is exactly the opposite. We became the third largest democracy in the world. We became the largest economy in Southeast Asia. Our economy now grows at 6.5%. Uh, even at the height of the global financial crisis, we grew by 4.5%, which is the third highest in Asia after China and India. We have the largest middle class uh, in Southeast Asia. We have political stability. Uh, we have a strong democracy, uh, and so on and so on. You know, and we have a strong uh, global role as a member of the G20. So we are now in a place that is quite surprising, given where we are. We were uh, in the year 
1999 and, and, and 2000. I think one of the best statistics that I have ever heard and very revealing was uh, the one uh, founded by uh, Shafra Mujani, who actually is connected here, right? Uh, okay. Yes. yes. Yeah, he found in one of his research that 85% of Indonesians uh, believe that the country, uh, believe in the system that the country has adopted, 85%. Uh, they may not like the government, they may not like the president or the politicians or the parliament, but they, basically they believe that democracy uh, and our economic prospects are good. You know, you can't ask for any better than that. Right? And this is similar to a similar findings, uh, I think in Brazil, China and India, between 85 to 92 percent also feel that way. And in fact, in India, they had a recent poll that found that even the poor people, for the first time, feel a sense of entitlement, right? Uh, of course, India has still a lot of poor people, but before, they felt fatalistic about their future. Uh, the difference now with the rise, the rise of India is that the poor people too feel a sense of entitlement and some kind of hope for uh, the future. So this is where we are now, yeah, and we're in good place. But the point is, uh, you know, don't take it for granted. I think the first challenge is uh, we have to avoid falling into the middle income trap, right? Uh, now we have climb the ladder from low-income country to middle-income country. You know, we're still in the lower part of that middle-income status. But the, the scary part is we should remain stuck there. You know, we might climb fast from low-income to middle-income status, but out of about 100 countries in the 60s that the World Bank counted as middle-income, only 10, only 10 were able to rise to uh, the next level, which is develop uh, uh, high income status, right? Only 10 out of over 100, right? Many remain stuck in that middle income trap, they call it, right? They don't go lower, they don't go higher, but they remain stuck there. And that is very much the challenge that we face. How do we escape uh, and avoid that middle income trap? I, know. I say this because, you know, Asia is supposed to be the you know, the, the story of the century. You know, people talk about the Asian century. Uh, there is a good scenario in the Asian century uh, whereby by 2050, uh, the combined GDP of Asia would be around $163 trillion, right, of Asia. And about seven, about 90% of that will come from seven countries, which is China, Japan, Korea, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand. 90% of that would come from what is called the Asia 7. So the optimistic scenario would be by 2050, total GDP would rise to $160 trillion. There would be not a single poor country in uh, Asia, and almost all countries in Asia would have living standard comparable to Europe today and the size of the middle class would be an additional two billion dollars. Sorry, two billion people additional on top of what we have already. All right, so it's a remarkable optimistic scenario. That's a high scenario. But the low case scenario is not that. The low case scenario is that by 2050, uh, it's out of 160 trillion, it would be only 60 trillion. All right, uh, instead of two billion dollars, Two billion additional middle class is a lot less than that, right? Uh, and there will still be some poor countries in Asia, as opposed to none at all, in the high or optimistic scenario, right? So for us in Indonesia, I think we should assume that some countries will follow the, the high scenario and others will follow the low scenarios, right? We've been on the right track, uh, like I said, uh, you know, six and a half percent. It's quite impressive. People say that Indonesia will be the top 10 economies in the world in the coming decades. And the Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd said we will be the number six largest economies in the world by 2040. Uh, the assumption that is also supported by city uh, uh, analysts. But these are only projected growth. You know, projected growth. Uh, you don't know what will happen. 
right? Uh, and uh, how we manage our transformation from now on, our democracy, uh, our governance, uh, our freedom, uh, and our foreign policy, our global engagement will, will matter. Uh, I think uh, I should uh, remind you of uh, the scenario that happened uh, around uh, the US, Japan, and Germany. Uh, is that coming from my body? Or? <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, there's uh, this book, uh, The Coming Jobs War, uh, and the Gallup uh, president, uh, he reminded us that about 30 years ago, uh, there was prediction that America was number one, uh, Germany was number two or number three, and Japan was number two or number three. And the prediction was America was in decline, right? And they said that uh, by about 20 years time, that Japan would be the number two economy with six trillion dollars, and Germany would be the number three economy with about five trillion dollars, and America would decline to number three uh, with only three trillion dollars, right? So this is what they predicted, uh, and many people uh, sort of accepted that that would happen. But they were only two-thirds right, because Japan did become a six trillion dollar economy. Germany did become a five trillion dollar economy. But America, rather than going down to three trillion, went up to 13 trillion, right? So it's a 10 trillion dollar difference, right? Uh, and America remained to be the number one economies in the world. In other words, uh, America beat that negative uh, uh, projection uh, and in fact kept an upward projection. Right? And it was quite interesting uh, reason of how he said that would, that was done. It was done because he said there was about a thousand people that move and produce that trillion dollar economy. You know, a thousand Bill Gates and uh, Walmart guy, what's his name, uh, Warren Buffet and, and so on and so on, right? I'm not sure if that's entirely a correct explanation of what actually happened for America to add that 10 trillion dollar economy. But the fact is, uh, something happened. America reinvented itself in that course, including with the IT uh, economy, uh, information technology that transformed the economic and social systems as well and made it happen for them to become number one. I don't know if America will become number one in the next 30 years. People say China will take over. but. Uh, this is a great lesson for Indonesia, for us to maintain that projection. Uh, we need to uh, not take things for granted. And I think one of the most important things for us is to maintain and evolve the right kind of nationalism in, in Indonesia. Right? And why do I say this is important? Because the type of nationalism that a country adopts affects where it goes internally and externally. Uh, you know. Uh, China adopted the right kind of nationalism, uh, oh, the wrong kind of nationalism and the wrong kind of internationalism uh, during Mao Zedong. And look at what happened in, in, in China. You know, it became the poorest country in Southeast Asia. Millions died out of starvation during the uh, Great Leap Forward, uh, 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 and so on and so on. China became xenophobic, uh, and uh, it became very unproductive. But when China evolved the right kind of nationalism, uh, open nationalism, you know, after uh, during the time of Deng Xiaoping and the right kind of internationalism, look at what happened, right? And compare North Korea and South Korea. You know, North Korea is one of the most xenophobic and inward looking and isolated country in the world, and total opposite with South Korea, which had evolved the right kind of nationalism and a very open and embracing internationalism. And look at the difference in economic and social and political development between the two countries. The same thing goes to Indonesia. Our responsibility now is really to maintain the right kind of nationalism. What kind of nationalism it is? It's the open, moderate, tolerant, uh, and creative uh, nationalism. Right? Uh, if we lose this, if we revert and we change course, then we will not be able to reach the upward projection that many say Indonesia uh, will, will achieve. And I think one of the key factors in that is the role of the youth. You know, uh, I think uh, you know I don't I don't even consider myself a youth anymore. Uh, you know, I got three kids already, right, and one wife. And uh, but you know, um, many of you are, who are in their twenties, uh, uh, you definitely belong to to that category. 
and I think uh, the youth today is the most powerful force uh, that Indonesia has ever seen. You know, uh, you, you recall that when during our revolution in 1945, or our national awakening in 1928, it was the youth. I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about millions of youth, I'm talking only about a handful of youth who actually changed history and established our republic, right? Uh, well, multiply that by millions, then, right? The power of the youth today uh, in terms of their capacity uh, and what they're able to do, uh, their sense of idealism. Uh, it's, uh, it has made the youth in Indonesia today the most formidable force for change ever. Right? And I think this is what you're seeing now, not just in Indonesia, but uh, you know, throughout uh, the, the, emerging, uh, the emerging world. Uh, I think we're living in, in what I would call the age of the individual. You know, uh, I think during my father's time and my grandfather's and great-great-grandfather's time, uh, the individual was was not uh, was a weak entity. You know, he was just a number or just a name. You know, uh, and governments were strong. Uh, communities were strong because our whole, our whole ideological value is all about community. It's not about individualism. Uh, there were many illiterate people, people who couldn't produce for themselves, look after themselves, let alone their families. So individuals were weak in our nation in previous generations. But now uh, the individuals are, are very strong. You know, they're not just a name, not just uh, an, uh, an ID. They're a voice. Uh, and they're more than just a book, they are a force, you know. Uh, and this is why when people look at the Arab Spring, uh, countries falling, sorry, governments falling, regimes falling, it's, people say it's about the spread of democracy, but it's really, I think, uh, a sign that we live in the age of the individual. It's individuals with handphones, with uh, Facebooks and Twitters who bring governments down. You know, the combined force of individuals, once they get a will, once become once they become a force is just so enormous. And this is what I want you want what I need to remind you of. You know, the the youth is a formidable 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 force living in the most exciting time and age, which is the age of the individual. The most paradox that can happen is if the youth uh, in such exciting time where they have all the tools of change become close-minded, you know, and become dogmatic. And I'm sorry to say this, I see this a lot in Indonesia. And sometimes I see this in the United States. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of, well, not a lot, but some pockets of youth in Indonesia who just remain dogmatic, remain focused and stuck with jargons that belong in the 70s, in the 60s, uh, who are afraid of the world rather than seeing it part of uh, uh, a sea of opportunity that they should uh, embrace. Uh, and I spent a lot of time back in Indonesia going to campus, and whenever I finished a speech, like the one I just gave, you know, they would say, oh, we're anti-colonialism, we're anti-imperialism, we're anti-capitalism, we're anti-this, you know. And, and then uh, I remind them, look, you know, only three or four countries now are still colonized in the whole international system, right? Uh, I suppose to during my daddy's time when about half or two thirds of the countries were still colonized. You know? So you you you're too late. You know? uh, pick a new jargon. You know, you, can't, you come up with your own jargon for your own time. You know, and they ask me, sir, what will be your jargon? Ours is revolution. And I say, well, fine. Mine is innovation. Mine is entrepreneurship. Mine is excellence. You know, mine is openness. It's even globalization. Right? Because if you're afraid of globalization, but others are not, you lose. Right? One of the most interesting uh, survey that I've ever seen, and you can look it up, uh, is called by, is by a foundation, it's a French name, I don't speak French, but it sounded like Le Foundation Politique. Yeah. Foundation Politique, right? And it does a global survey of the youth around the world. And it's one of the most interesting surveys. Because they ask questions about what they think about globalization. And you know what country loves, not just likes or doesn't mind, what country loves globalization the most in the world, they found? China. <laughs> Chinese youth 
91% love globalization and see it as opportunity and sign of national strength and sign of a uh, uh, factor in China's prosperity. Mao Zedong would, what do you call it, flip in his grave, how you say it, roll, roll over his grave, right? 89% in India, 89% believe that globalization is good. Uh, for South Africa, it's about, uh, I think, 79%. Uh, Brazil, also around that high. America, it was about 74%. Right? I don't know if that's accurate, if you think that's accurate or not, but uh, it's about 74 The lowest is about Greece, which is about low 40s, and doesn't surprise me, right? But again, this refers back to my earlier comment, that there's this a new economic and social and psychological phenomenon sweeping the emerging world uh, is called the rise of confidence. Uh, and uh, I don't know how long we will keep it because like nationalism, it's a psychological phenomenon. You know, uh, it doesn't stay up all the time. You know, nationalism, there's a high point. American nationalism was high during 9-11 and it was low during Vietnam War, for example, right? So it's, there's high point and low point. And this confidence in Indonesia, in Brazil, in China, in Turkey, in Mexico, in Colombia, it doesn't last forever. I would say it lasts a few years, right? And this is why you gotta keep this momentum and strike the goal while uh, it's hot. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it's a good time for us to be Indonesians. Uh, uh, but uh, don't take things for granted. And there's a lot more work for us to fulfill uh, the promise of uh, 21st century Indonesia. I'll stop there and I'll take any questions or comments from you. Thank you. Jeff, go ahead. Any questions? Go ahead. Yes. Um, based on you already mentioned that, um, I, I'm glad to know that the 90%, uh, based on the prediction, the 90% of economy comes from the seven countries including Indonesia. So uh, do we need to take for granted the role of education, the quality of education, to strengthen the, the economy growth? Thank you. Well, uh, I, I think we do. I think one of the things that uh, we still need to catch up is on the uh, scientific literacy. You know, uh, I think this is an issue for America as well. You know, and the latest results of uh, PISA, uh, they found out that uh, uh, many Asian countries are doing well on that score, especially on uh, scientific uh, literacy. Uh, but Indonesia is not among them, right? And I think uh, if you need to compete and advance our political and economic and social transformation, uh, we got to shift focus, not just fighting illiteracy. I mean, when we became independent, 99% were illiterate, but now, the number of literacy is quite high. And what we need to shift is to focus more on scientific literacy in our uh, education. And even in America, they're, they're, they're having problems. Uh, I think a good friend of mine said that, correct me if I'm wrong, 25% of uh, people in high school don't, don't graduate here. Uh, and, and so on and so on, you know. Uh, you, you, you see really a difference in the uh, uh, how uh, education is placed as a priority in society. One of the things that surprised me most in Korea uh, was when I saw there was a week of national exams in Korea. And that became apparently the most important week uh, ever. Uh, people are not allowed to honk on the streets because uh, you know, it would bother people who are writing exams. And there are stories about students who are late to exams and they were escorted by police in police, what do you call it, motorcade, to go to school so that the kid doesn't uh, uh, miss the exam. Uh, 